planning a year entry before. We've been doing these on an annual basis. I think we had a skip last year for a different topic. But this is fourth in the installment, and uh, we try to get a little more compact as we go and cover it uh, in terms of what's relevant for these activities. So the first thing I want to do is give you a disclaimer. And we're not going to have you sign anything before you leave in terms of uh, what you're going to see here, but we're going to show you some things. It's, this presentation contains more facts than it contains opinions. Okay? And in the areas that are opinions, okay, we're all going to argue with about I'm going to label those opinion on that just so we're straight between the two items. So facts and opinions in the presentation, and I hope you can discern those as we go forward. So first up is that the cost of flying is everybody's mind. So you see these little anecdotes go through there, you know, the world's on empty as the tank is full. And I don't know what LLLMG or FWTF stands for. My daughter's in the back, so we want to explain those items, but it's all on our, on our minds, right? So this is the kind of the sick joke. But in the background of this, it really is about affordable airworthiness. Right? And you had to put an underline on this chart on the affordable part, because obviously, if you can't afford to do it, you might as well not go after the second part of the injective. The other part of this is that easy button. And I'm sure Staples is going to come after me for stealing some of these logos. But the airworthiness side is, it's a matter of fact, is that for decades, you had the easy button. Right? There's been a lot of development on fuels. Add gas was add gas. Put it in the tank, add to the screen. Very few things in terms of concerns about what was the quality of fuel had to do with all the grades. All those that. It was a fairly easy button in terms of the fuel That's starting to change a bit. Okay, so let's go through some history in the current situation. Current situation in aviation fuels are that environmental concerns are driving changes to both aviation piston and turbine fuel supplies. The turbine fuel supplies are moving to 50-50 crude oil and synthetic blends because of environmental pressures on CO2 emissions. Aviation piston fuels are moving towards unleaded formulations from crude oil or synthetics on environmental pressures from lead emissions and the mandated inclusions of biofuels and auto gas. So you have, you have fuel streams that are changing that are using aviation. We can use ad gas, we have people using motor gas, we have people using jet fuel. And all three of those fuel streams are changing. And they're changing to maybe out of environmental concerns. Those changes are multi-dimensional. They are presenting challenges today. Okay, they're long term, and they just need to be dealt with as we go forward. Once again, in the context of airworthiness. Alternative jet fuels have been certified and they're now entering into commercial production and use. You might have heard about the Navy's Great Green Fleet initiative. Well, that was the US military's initiative to reduce dependency on international fuel sources and use alternative sources of domestic supply. But there's also these issues in terms of within the EU, the carbon emissions tax, which was the big to do the civil transport world. All of this is about alternate fuels in the jet stream. Those efforts have been focused largely on what's called the Catholic Consortium of the uh, Civil Aviation Alternate Fuels Initiative. On the piston fuel side, the situation as of today is that you do have alternate piston fuels that have been certified and not commercial production and use. One of which is in the EU, okay, under EOS jurisdiction, ASTM standard UL91 grade. Within the US, on a broader basis, the FAA's Atlanta Aviation Transition Arm, and now the US Congress is focused on a full fleet UL100 transition. So we're going to introduce the first opinion here. My colleague inserted the UL100. Okay. These are significant developments in 2011 and 2012. You have the actual introduction of synthetics in the turbine fuel side. You have the actual mandates via Congress on the ad gas side. You have actual production and distribution of UL91. And okay, my opponent's opinion is that we should be targeting UL100 grade. My opponent's opinion is that these, these developments are very significant in 2011-2012, and they have implications for us long term in the future. So. Let's take a look at fuel source change drivers. And this is a daily 
production of U.S. transportation. This is a worldwide. Don't take the numbers down to the full significant digits that are displayed. But this is just in the aggregate. Is that you have changes happening on the low gas side in terms of mandated inclusion of biogas. Ethanol. States mandated inclusion of ethanol in road fuels is having an effect on the automobile gasoline supply. On the jet side, CO2 and NOx emissions are focusing changes in the jet fuel supply and the technology that we have in turbines. And on the gas side, the tetra for lead content. Lead, tetra for lead, okay, has neurological toxicity issues. It's a fact. Fuel source change drivers, and this is a chart from discussions at ICAO. Okay, so you talk about from the folks that, that burn the most fuel, which is civil transport. Okay, they burn a lot of fuel, and they're taking a look at how they reduce CO2 emissions long term. So this chart right here, if you look at the, at the very bottom of the chart, and it's in fine print, so we're going to enlarge it here. You have a timeline from 2012 to where today, up to 2050. So you have discussions taking place on an international level, which is setting targets for what the emissions footprint should look like five decades out, four decades out. A big part of the reduction in CO2 emissions is coming from the introduction of alternative fuels into the civil transport and fuel stream. The main point on this chart is that international agreements today are setting the footprint for the next decades, if not years. And the difficulty that we have in terms of the marketplace and consumers and immediate our worthiness issues is that you have to think of 30 years in advance. Okay? The average age of an aircraft in the U.S. is how many years old? I guess. 27 to 30 years old. Right? So, so these things last for a long period of time. And you have to take a look at multiple decades of their worthiness. So, system to systems impact, you're, you're dealing with the fuel specification and it's tied to the entire spectrum. So you achieve airworthiness by making certain you're addressing all these pieces of the equation. There was a presentation earlier, it's not a tremendously complex kind of picture here, but you've got a lot of check boxes that you've got to take off from the logistics stream and all these impacts. All these elements, they're all elements of our worthiness, they're all elements of continued operational safety. If you change one piece of it, you could have an impact on the other pieces. So when we as manufacturers of equipment, as producers of fuel, as operators of aircraft, you achieve this high degree of airworthiness, okay, and a high degree, high the very good safety record we have by taking a look at all these items. You have a POH. You operate your aircraft within those limitations you find on the POH. Producers manufacturing fuel according to the fuel spec, the distributors making certain it shows up at the FBO, performance of the fuel spec, the design and aircraft and engine to utilize all those pieces. It all fits together. So let's go through recent developments and go 2011 2012. Cover the current situation, what are the more details on these developments? If we take a look at engines, we're going to reduce the scope here to the internal combustion engine. Okay, engines with pistons or Lambo rotaries. You have two types of engines. You have a diesel cycle engine, you have an auto cycle, pistons. They're sensitive to different things on a broad basis in terms of how they perform. At kind of a fundamental level, spark ignited engines, octane sensitive, diesel cycle self ignition engines, C tank sensitive. Both of these parameters, in a loose sense, governs how long it takes for your peak cylinder pressure to arrive after the fuel either self ignites or your spark ignites. Simple term. Okay, for the engineering side, we can go for a half hour on the details of this, but in very simple terms, it's a basic performance parameters of fuel and the cycles of the power. We feed these things in aviation with, on the outer cycle, the spark that is either auto gas or aviation gas. And on the diesel cycle, we feed it with turbine fuel. Okay, so this is the matchup of the options that we have in aviation today. On the automotive gasoline side, it's a spark ignition fuel fit for purpose and the specification is designed for automotive transport. And it has a wide global variation, mainly because the specifications are engineered. Okay, the specifications are actually built for emissions control, startability, and drivability. It's an automotive fuel spec. It's designed and the fuel is produced for what's important for your automobile. 
on the aviation gas inside, it's fit for purpose as an aviation gas. That's exactly what the specification says. It's an aviation gas clean, it's spark ignition fuel, designed to be globally consistent. If you have transport of aircraft going over long distance, at one time when DC 3s and DC 6s were carrying civil folks around civil transport, very uniform because you're carrying them over long distance. On the turbine fuel side, it is great cycle fuel. It's a different sort of fuel. It's designed and fit for purpose for aviation turbines. And it is very globally consistent. Okay, so three different fuel streams, three different cycles. And the current status today is if you look at automotive producers, so if you go to the Ford Motors exhibit, and they got some very nice cars. You take a look at the Ford Mustang, you take a look at, the, at those vehicles, you take a look at a Jaguar today, or whatever it is. The high performance automobiles, whether Mercedes, Porsche, or whatever, they're being designed around 91 BKI automotive gasoline for high performance engine. And those engines will take advantage of that grade. And if you have to pump in a lesser grade fuel at the pump, the engine performance will be great. So 91 BKI and E0 standard is pretty much the standard worldwide for automotive gasoline in terms of the premium fuel. You do have specialty racing fuels, you do have to some extent advertising. People, you know, put a 93 into my tank and think I get something more out of it. Actually, your engine is about topping out at 91. Aviation gasoline, the standard is 100 LL today. There's some alternate specs in Russia and China that are produced. On the target fuel side, we have Jet A and A1, large distribution production and aviation. Two different specifications. One is a military spec, one is a civil spec. So these three fuel streams are changing long term. The question is, is what are they going to look like long term? Because if you're buying an aircraft today, if you have an existing aircraft, you're probably interested in how am I going to operate this thing for the next year, two years, decades, whatever I'm doing. So we have an infrastructure shift. We talk about how environmental concerns are affecting the fuel supply. So you have these cycles, diesel cycle, auto cycle, you have internal combustion engines. And we're feeding them with automotive gasoline, aviation gasoline, and we're feeding them with turbine fuel. And today we know what that fuel supply is. Okay? You can and still some places get 91 AKI from gas without ethanol. It's becoming a reduced subset. Very hard to find 93 AKI fuel without ethanol. Ethanol goes octane. It's a way to spike the fuel to get the octane up. Aviation gasoline, you got 100 LL. Turbine fuel, you've got Jet A1, you've got Jet and, and synthetic jets. 2011 to 2020, what we see is we see 91 AKI E10. As more countries adopt the mandated inclusion of biomass, instead of using that ethanol to spike it up, they're, re they're reducing basically the automotive base octane stock because there's mandated inclusion of ethanol. So it will progressively become more difficult to obtain 9.8 AKI ethanol free fuel, mainly because the refining and producing to a lower grade because you have a lot of spiking going on with ethanol. On the ad gas side, we have 100 LL. And on the turbine fuel side, what's happening today is that there's now two types of synthetic turbine fuel that are certified and will be entering into the commercial fuel stream. One that's based on hydrogenated renewable jet, which is a fancy word for biomass derived, and SDK, synthetic paraffinated kerosene, which are fuels derived from natural gas, from alternate hydrocarbons, and converted to efficient fuels. Interesting development, in 2011, Total okay, decided to start putting UL91 on air fuels. So today, in Europe, not in the US, go to the UK or air fuel in France and increasingly in those countries and now spreading to the EU, you can now find an unleaded air gas grade UL91. Another thing that's happening is that within the automotive side and largely driven by mandated inclusion for more biomass, you now have activity in the automotive side which is driving up the ethanol content to potentially 15% ethanol content. This is driving some very big changes in the automotive regime. It affects largely fuel systems. Okay? The E10, E15, once again more corrosive than even the regular base ethanol, changing a lot of systems on that side. But that's a fact, and that's happening in the automotive. 
The big question is going to be, what's 2020 look like? So, so what does the real future of these fuels look like? And we're going to get into the area of like Homie's best guess, okay, based on how we see these things rolling out. Well, once you have mandated the inclusion of E15 by certain countries and gain steam, you're now going to have automotive, you know, much more knowledge you have E15 in the automotive fuels train. Automobiles will be designed to handle it globally. It's just going to be a matter of fact because there's a lot of fuel produced with, with mandated inclusion of ethanol. 2020 and beyond, like only firmly believe, you're going to have a UL 100 grade and you might have a lower grade UL 91 for different reasons. You'll probably have a lower grade UL 91 because the automotive feed stocks, okay, at E15, are going to be very hard for aircraft to handle. Okay, so, so if you bought an aircraft today or yesterday, okay, and it was certified on use of MOGAS, okay, and you now increase that ethanol content, you're going to need to pay attention to what's going to happen on the seals that you use, the gases that you use, the fuel lines that you use, because they not, may not be the right materials construction to handle the E15. Automotive, okay, for those of us who are not engineers, to our, our cars for 20 years. The average lifespan of an automobile okay, for the consumer is five to seven years. They move them around, they can renew and adapt that technology. As automotive moves from the 10 to the 15 infrastructure, those guys are going to change. The question is, is for aircraft that is certified on E10 or E5 or whatever it is, what are you going to do with those that automotive stock moves up to the 15? That's from what my opponent's perspective you're going to need some type of unleaded, low octane, unleaded ad gas rate. And it's not going to be for a large part of the consuming population, but it's going to be significant. And it's going to need to be an alternative to automotive stocks if the automotive stocks become less suitable for aviation use. So, I'm going to clearly label that. That's like Homie's opinion. There are some facts here in terms of the mandated inclusion of ethanol and increasing amount of ethanol inclusion of fuel. And it's largely related to roads for vehicles that are used on roads that are paid for by taxes. So you're going to be able to buy wholesale, you know, non-ethanolized fuel. You might be, but it'll be wholesale, and it's going to be harder to obtain, more expensive to maintain, because your main fuel flow is going to be for the own motor side. The UL91 is showing up at airports for some extent taxes in individual countries, for some extent the variability of the automotive fuel stops. And the fact is, on the aviation side, largely driven by the long-term needs to offset CO2 emissions, you're going to see more and more synthetics driven into the aviation fuel stream. If aviation target fuel is not straight up kerosene. It's actually probably one of the best candidates for biomass for alternate fuel inclusions inside of it because it is a special fuel to begin with. So you'll we'll see synthetics more likely to use the jet fuel stream. So, let's take a look at those fuel stream trends and we'll, we'll put some bullets next to them. The automotive gasoline side, increasing levels of ethanol and ground transport fuels are reducing the base fuel octane. So, ethanol can spike octane as you include more ethanol and refineries optimize more around ethanol waste fuel. They're going to reduce the base stock so they can increase the amount of regular auto gasoline fuel, base it with ethanol, and bring it up to step. The other fact is, is that, like Homing, okay, we did approve auto gas on a large number of our engines, mostly the IL 360s. The problem that we have currently today is that since we approved that item about two years ago, two and a half years ago, the automotive fuel specification has changed, I think, two times already. Our ability to keep up with the automotive fuel specification changes is a big pain in the you know what, okay, for the manufacturers on these vehicles. We don't govern the automotive fuel specs, so in order to make sure that we're addressing continued operation safety issues, we have to keep pace with all these changes that happen in the automotive world. That's capable, that's not a technology that necessary. The first one is technology. On the aviation gasoline side, it is a factor of UL91 and unleaded ad gas, the commodity unleaded ad gas is bad. This is a non proprietary commodity spec. Is there a good production? It is distributed and approved for use within the EU. 
That's a pretty significant test. That means that we were actually working the machinery to be able to migrate to one of the others. It is in one certain area of the world. It is driven by different reasons. They have all different tax structures. They have all different distribution structures. But the fact is, is that the refinery decided to make it. The fact is, is that people decided to distribute it. And the EU decided to put a blanket approval in place for UL-91 for a very wide range of aircraft, just based on engine approval, without an STC, without any action by the types of people holding that's pretty significant. Uh, UL91 is actually 91 octane, not like out of oil and gas. Chase 91 is really about 85. Correct. You, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. UL91 is an ad gas grade 91. It's 91 motor octane number. So on the same basis as 100 LL, it's 91. We'll go into that more detail. That's a very good question. The other part of this is that there is continued progress as, as the FAA UA just the existence. The FAA unleaded air gas transition arm and the inclusion of language in the FAA reauthorization law okay, has picked up uh, support for folks who are on the active on EO 100. So prior to the formation of the ARP, prior to that action in Congress, we had a lot of folks saying, well, you know what? Why should I do you all 100? There's no demand. Well, now what you're seeing is the demand is becoming fixed and the demand is becoming mandated and a transition is becoming mandated. So this is now going to happen and it's spawning the investment and it's spawning the work being done. And the, one of the best things from the UATR is what boxes do you need to check to be able to get this across the market? U.S. Congress, we can debate the effectivity of U.S. Congress, uh, and we're not supposed to do that in the guidelines that I'm given by EAA here, but U.S. Congress has set requirements for the FAA to define and let the FBS transition plan. So it is now law that the FAA has to do something that didn't exist prior to the passage of the FAA authorization law. That's a big deal. That's a tremendous deal because the FAA takes the law very seriously in terms of their own execution. And U.S. Congress also follows up on what it puts into its laws. So three significant things. On the aviation turbine fuels, we have to take this in two parts. Aviation turbine fuels for turbine engines. Multiple solutions for Jet A, A1, 50-50, so crude oil, synthetic fuel, drop-ins for aviation turbine engines have now arrived. There's now two specifications, and the FAA has ruled that these 50-50 blends are a drop-in for the crude oil derived turbine fuel. That is a big deal for the certification, distribution, production, and introduction to widespread use for the civil aviation transport community. It's a huge volume of fuel. On the turbine fuels for diesel engines, okay, so we're talking about turbine fuel used in the diesel cycle. EASA, in the last year, actually I think it was around February, issued special conditions for self-ignition diesel cycle engines. Okay? Diesel engines in aviation are special breed. And when you put a diesel cycle and use jet fuel on it, there are certain things that happen. And EASA actually issued guidance based on the experience of the diesels that are in there in the field as to what you need to do in terms of certification and how you maintain our worthiness of it. The other significant item is that the U.S. military uses a lot of JPA on their ground vehicles. The U.S. military changed the JPA specification in 2011 to not only have report values in terms of C10 lubricity, but in terms of synthetics, they actually control C10 lubricity for the synthetic fuels that they use. Okay, so the U.S. military changed the JPA fuel spec based on the utilization of jet fuel and diesel cycle engines. The negative here for the current situation is on the civil fuel. The civil fuel specifications don't control C10 lubricity for diesel cycle engines. And Jet A1 5050 blend fuel does affect C10 lubricity. So you have some positive items happening in terms of turbine fuels for diesel engines. You have some non positive items happening in diesel fuel for turbine engines. The fact is, is that from the regulatory side, from the ASTM side, this is now becoming a more mainstream discussion. It's generally recognized that if you're going to do something in this realm, we have equivalent issues that you have.
have a bottle gas in terms of long term suitability as you have in terms of two and three degrees of cycle. Okay, let's talk about UL91. So we're going to switch gears a little bit to so UL91. And labeling this very clearly ASTM D7547 UL91. Three kind of very significant items. This is an alleged commodity 91 motor octane on rapids. It's an ASTM spec fuel. It's a commodity produced by a very wide range of sources. Because it's an ASTM specification, production, distribution across state lines, across international boundaries becomes much easier when you're adhering to these types of specifications. You have something that you can now handle in the logistics range. So let's get calibrated at octane. Ground fuels, depending upon which country you are, are rated at either RON or API. Research octane number or API. Anybody here from Europe? For Australia? Okay. Europe and Australia, they love to advertise run. So when you pull up to the premium, the super premium pump, it's 98. Okay. They like to use research octane number because it's not a big number. It's a bigger number. The marketing guys love the bigger number. Okay? So if you're in Australia, if you're in Europe, they like the bigger number, you throw off 98 on the board. If you're in automotive racing in the US and you want race control, you get the research octane number at if you're a ground transport fuel, where the advertising is legislated by the state's ways and means, those regulations, it's advertised in the AKI, anti noxious Okay, so there's two different rating systems for the fuel. Ground fuel is typically a ground or AKI. You'll never see MON on a motor rock on a ground fuel because the marketing department is the lowest number of the Aviation fuel side is rated in motor octane number, MON. It is the lowest number of these. AKI is equal to RON plus MON divided by 2. And the arithmetic average of the 2. So if I've got a ground fuel uh, that I'd say is a, I'm out racing in Australia, and I want the 100, I want the 100 octane stuff. So I'm out my own race fuel, it's 100 octane, maybe even 110 octane stuff. On the motor octane scale for aviation fuel, it's 100 if I'm buying 110, for example. It's 90 if I'm buying 100. Okay, so different rating scales. We have to be very clear. Whenever somebody says octane, your very first question out of your mouth ought to be, what rating system is it? Is it RON, is it API, or is it motor octane? Extremely important. How is it labeled? How do I know what it is? So if we take a look at ABEX, $100. $100 by specification is 100 motor octane out of the fuel. In Michigan, I was on vacation in Michigan, and there was racing fuel at the pump that was labeled 110, and it was leaded fuel. And I pretty much, I'm kind of sus suspecting that it might have been added gas that they put in the ground fuel pump for the guys who were doing racing in the other direction. Add gas 80, and there was a grade 80 grade, okay, in terms of raw and research octane number, it was 90 and API was 85. Okay. Pretty lousy stuff. It wasn't even as good as your regular octane fuel that you have today on the 87 grade. When we talk about MOGAS at 93 API or 98 research octane number falls in there, and MOGAS at 98, so you have the, the premium MOGAS and you have the super premium MOGAS. Then you have ABGAS fuel 91. So the numbers here are representative, but when you talk about ABGAS fuel 91, it is under low lead without the tether of the lead. It's pretty darn good fuel. Okay? It's better than the Super Premium 93 API. Okay? It's very well controlled. It's an aviation fuel, and that's where the, where the things stand out. So this part of the presentation is about 91 motor octane of aviation gas and fuel. When you talk about auto gas STCs, they may be talking about 91 API, the ground transport fuel, or 93 API. Very, very important, can't stress it enough. When you talk about octane, make certain that you know what rating system it is. So some background. So where did this D7547 come from? And how did this, it is a production specification for lead aviation fuel. How did it arrive? It was sponsored by the US DOD. It's the Defense EEC, Defense Energy Conservation, I think it's now Defense Logistics Agency. It was sponsored by them for their UAV fleet, which is largely powered by Rotax engines and UEL engines on all gas. 
pluviolosis of Orlando, the road tax in Orlando. They sponsor that specification because of, of with the US military, they were dealing with a high degree of volume gas variability worldwide, which was affecting reliability. So you're pulling fuel from wherever it is you're operating a predator, right? Pumping in auto gas, and you have reliability issues on there. On the 100 LL side, you put 100 LL on it, you get very predictable reliability, but you're adversely affecting durability. Okay? You have lead deposits in an engine, that, quite frankly, doesn't need 100 LL. Okay? So, so lead is a contaminant on a low compression engine, and it's adversely affecting the durability of it. So the US DOD sponsored this fuel, mainly trying to address these two items. The fuel is the same as 100 LL with LTDL. If you look at the fuel specification, it is literally missing the paragraph that says potential level lead and all the good, bad stuff. Good at being performance wise, bad at being toxic and acid generating by stuff from the specification. It can be produced by just about any current 100 LL facility. The physical properties are the same as 100 LL. So from your operating limitations in terms of altitude, in terms of whether starting or anything else, it is the same stuff as 100 LL, but it's a lower octane rate without lead. Back to your question, it is a minimum 91 motor octane number grade aviation fuel. And in aviation fuel, the properties are controlled to the FBO. Anybody know where the properties for auto gas are controlled to? From the refinery to the tank of your car in the auto gas world, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about two weeks. Actually, they pump a lot of auto gas, it's a very short shelf life. Okay, aviation fuel is meant to be stored for a long period of time. So auto gas is controlled in the distribution line, wholesale distribution line. In terms of aviation gasoline, it needs to be that value at the FPO, it needs to be very stable. So very significant ad gas, this unleaded ad gas is stable to the point of the FPO stable for a very long period of time and it's not even a lower octane. In terms of distribution, this is a map as of February 2012. And this is, you know, Lycoming is not including this along with Total. This just happened. Prior to Lycoming approving the all 91 in any of our engines, is that Total started producing this and distributing it in these two countries. And now it's also in Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, Sweden, and a number of these places in different fashion. It's far more prevalent in the UK and France, probably because of taxes. Okay, but it is starting to appear more in mass. So key facts, it is not automotive gasoline. This is ad gas. Okay, it's not the same rate. It is not the same as ASTM E910 grade 91. This is not the same as the old leaded ad gas. Okay, it is a different gas. It is not the same as the unleaded fuel ad gas that my plumbing actually approved in 95. So we've actually had an unleaded ad gas approved in my plumbing engine since 1995. And that was a Helco refinery 91, 96 as well. It's a different fuel. It's a My plumbing has released a service instruction called 1070R that approves this fuel on many of our engine models. And Yasa issued a, a uh, SIB that approved the aircraft without an STC, without a type certificate change, to use this type of fuel provided to be approved with fuel engine. So today, in the UK, or in France, or in Germany, if you've got a Cessna 152, or 172 Skyhawk, 182 Skylane, a type of Warrior, a type of Archer, or a there's a very large list of these items. If you have one of those aircraft without any STC, and without any type of TC action, like only specification for those aircraft are now approved in the old 91. That's a pretty big deal. Okay? This is a, a, a neat experiment to what we eventually need to get to in a broad day to do all the transitions. So another piece of this is that I want to make it very clear. UL 91 is not a hundred dollars replacement. And my phone is firmly positioned that you need to all 100. Okay. You have an existing fleet out there that's 100 times larger than today's current production rate. There is no new technology that the plumbing engineers today that is going to migrate 100 years of production within five years to something new. We have to deal with these small things. It's a stepping stone to a UL100 future if we can increase our technical knowledge over a TPO life cycle. 
to indicate what are some technical subjects called octane number increase, octane number requirement, and a big one, which is the lubricant. Today, the lubricants you use in your engines are designed to tolerate leaded fuel. When you remove the lead from the fuel, you remove some of the bad acting stuff that results in acids in your lubricant, which corrode your engines. If we can get the fleet off of leaded fuel, you're going to reduce corrosion issues, and you're going to increase the overall lifetime of the engine. This is something that our motor figured out. It was a big benefit to our motor, and it will be a big benefit to us. Getting the lead out is a good idea. It's not only good from a toxicology standpoint, it's very good in terms of the longevity of the equipment. Part of getting to that point is to get ourselves in the fleet basis. And my company is doing this. We have a collaboration program. So when we did our UL91 approval, we agreed with the FAA that we were going to enter into a collaboration program over the long term time to take a look at the effects on lubricants and other things that we could do to figure out what was going to happen in the future. So with Total on one side in terms of production of the fuel, Shell on the other side, in terms of taking a look at the lubricant formulations, you're actually acting now with a fleet operator in the UK, isolating an engine on a fleet to UL91, and taking a look at how can we improve this lubricant to be able to improve the longevity of the engines. So, I want to make it very clear again, Wycombe is not advocating UL91 as a solution. UL91 is a stepping stone to UL100 future. It's allowing us to do some very significant work in terms of prepping the system to understand what exactly do we need on this replacement fuel in terms of octane number increase, octane number requirement for the TBO, and it's allowing to do some very important things on the lubricant inside. The move to the main now. Color label at the introduction. Slight topic switch, UATR. My phone's perspective on that. A few years ago, I made a statement that guys, it's time to stop plugging the problem and start doing something about it. We've been discussing, discussing, and discussing. There's been a lot of good research work, and a lot of good research work done by a lot of very talented people and trying to find an exact substitute. And the main point there was, folks, you've proven through 20 years that you can't find an exact substitute at all levels. So let's move off that and figure out how we go forward. So we stopped loving that problem and we moved on to figuring out how to do that. And a very significant element of the UATR is kind of that roadmap, just specifically that roadmap and the checklist of the items that we need to do to get to the end of the future. My only opinion, the most significant artwork product is what's called the FBS Ready Display. For the companies that are bringing the fuel to the market, the ABS readiness level is literally, you know, everybody out here has a checklist before you even get into the aircraft for what you should do prior to taking off. You've got a checklist for how to handle coming back in, going where you're going, everything. So work on checklists. The ARR matrix is effectively a very high level checklist for the gate review program saying, okay, have I done this at this stage? The art work product gives everybody an equal playing field that's trying to bring fuel to the market and saying, okay, from a peer review process within the art, these are the boxes that you need to check and consider as you go forward. That hadn't existed and that wasn't a byproduct of the 20 years of research before. This is an implementation phase. Anybody here work in the manufacturing industry? When you build something, the toughest thing is transition to production. Okay. I'm not telling you, Thomas Edison, right? 1% perspiration, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, or maybe it's 10 But the biggest thing about this is perspiration. Prior to the arch formation, we didn't have the right broad cast in there to identify what exactly we're going to perspire doing for the next phase. The second most significant product was the identification of the issues related to fleet wide deployment. People didn't even know what the problems were. The number one problem was, well, we don't have $100 to replace them. Okay? It's very hard to work with that kind of high level problem. So what we did is we got very, very granular as to okay, specifically what is the problem. I didn't even know that to put a fuel, put a fuel in an air fuel, you know, the ultimate guy who has to say is the guy who's giving the fire insurance to the FBO center. And that's not an FAA certification issue. That's a local fire protection authority. Do I have the permit to even put this stuff on the field? 
Infrastructure work which helps everybody absolutely must be funded. There's a big price ticket that's been reported on the recommendations of the R. It's a very broad program. Like Honing's opinion, okay, is it probably not all that needs to be funded. But you know what? You better and darn fund the infrastructure work that's a benefit to everybody. Those very clear recommendations that say you've got to do X, Y, and Z on infrastructure, because if we're not doing that, we're not speaking the same language and getting to a solution. The ASTM approach provides the best path to transition and maintain the flow of our rates by Boeing's opinion. If you want to have the lowest cost of fuel to the consumer, you need to have a commodity where you have multiple sources of production, it's easy to transport, it's easy to get to market. ASTM provides a mechanism, yes it's onerous, but it provides a mechanism to a commodity, like homing opinion. If we stay focused, the solution is going to arrive to the market more quickly and without interruption to the user. Nobody asks Total to put UL-91 in airports in the UK. Total came to the conclusion that there was a production spec, that there was demand, there was a change in the marketplace with somebody to put something more stable than auto gas in an airport. And it happens. Don't underestimate the influence of market forces of demand. Very important. So, progress on many fronts. And we're going to summarize some key tables. U.S. Congress has defined an FAA requirement for action on fleet wide on the day gas transition. It is now the law set by U.S. Congress the FAA must look at unleaded out gas transition. That didn't exist before. The world outside of North America, one of I was introduced to this acronym when I was, when I was at Trader Shop in, in uh, Germany there, is that you know what, you guys are very US centric. You forget that there's a world outside of North America. But you know what? The world outside North America moved to unleaded out gas before the world's largest market for out gas went. We're taking a look at this. It's very important for us to take a look at the dynamics that are happening in these smaller marketplaces. Because they're moving, and they're moving to some extent faster than we are. AVX Fuel 91 is being produced, distributed, and legally used at lower cost than the hundred dollar in the year. Not everywhere. Very taxation dependent. EASA SIB, with one stroke of the pen, okay, and EASA demand, they approved a very large number of aircraft without an STC and without a tech certificate holder change. Greatly reducing the amount of paperwork and certification activity for the migration of this fuel. There's a lot more work to be done. UATR recommendations need to be accepted by FAA and funded by US Congress. Okay? The ARC was a recommendation board. We put a bunch of recommendations together. The FAA needs to go through those recommendations them, decide which ones to fund. If they don't have money, Congress has to put in some money to be able to do that. Congress, by the way, oversees the USA budget. You owe 100 efforts for the folks doing those items. You need to continue those, those steps towards implementation. And you really need to look at the FBS readiness levels as a guide, a roadmap. It's a very significant amount of work. And make certain that you're progressing through those elements. It's a very, very good check. UL91 experience needs to be leveraged to develop policy, labeling. How do I know what's in that pump? Is it the caliber airplane, the lubricants, and a whole bunch of other elements? All airworthiness aspects of the global variability of civil, civil aviation jet fuel needs to be addressed to ensure long term viability of these sub A little bit of a topic switch there, but it's fuel related. Like Homing's opinion are that the UATR's recommendations need to be accepted. Like 
opponent's opinion is that UL100 is the correct target. And my opponent's opinion is that if I was to pick on one thing we're behind the eight ball on, we had to figure this labeling out. And one of the best things that you can do as a user community is make certain you're paying attention. Because the labeling is a few steps behind. So Tal has done a very good job at their own initiative to figure out what the right label is for UL91 at the pump. That needs to be converted into a standard so that everybody knows how to match up the right fuel for their aircraft. So, well, it's clear. It's clear. The UL91 is clear. There's no dying. So, I'm going to say thank you. In a couple of lives, we get to QA. Started in the beginning with the four of our earnings. Our worthiness achieved not by luck, but by the design of all parts of the system. What did the Wright brothers invent? What was, what, was the, what was the real invention of the Wright brothers? Control of flight. Control of flight? What else? Power. 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 What else? Control of flight. Wind tunnel. Did, did gasoline exist when the Wright brothers flew their aircraft? Yes. Yeah. Careful. <laughs> Gasoline, in terms of production form, there was no specification of gasoline, so the Wright brothers invented control of flight. They invented a twisted blade propeller. They invented an engine, and they chose what this boiling and crude oil was resulting in. They chose the fuel, and that cracked it. It's so cracking to already get the right result. Okay? So their orders, their ability to fly, was chosen by the system, the system's approach. And the portability okay, is achieved by that same consideration. So in our migration, Pay attention as much to the portability side as the airworthiness side. Okay. It includes fuel. It's about affordable airworthiness. We'll do QA.